Amen. Father, Daddy God, I commend this time back into your hand. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Uh, I think we feel led to talk a little bit about our flesh <laughs> and um, the issues that we have in it. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He seeks whom he may devour. And the, my title is, The Enemy's Arrow Targets the Hill. And, um, and the reason why he seeks uh, the hill, because he knows what our weaknesses are by the things we do, and of course, by the things that we say. And I think of a target board where the shooter wants to get to the middle, where it will have the most effect. And even though he may shoot around the center, and obviously, if the enemy is shooting at us around the center, it's going to have some effect on our lives. But the most effect is derived by dead center. And so his arrow is targeted towards that dead center. Or in this case, I'm going to talk about uh, the hill. Uh, and it's interesting because when uh, this thought occurred to me, for some reason I started thinking about uh, the Achilles heel. And the Achilles heel is a weakness in spite of overall strength, which can lead to our downfall. So this weakness, despite the other victories that we have in our lives uh, or the, the strength that we have in other parts of our lives. This Achilles heel, which I would say that all of us have somewhere in our flesh, uh, he targets it. And our overall strength can be that we do go to church, we do pray, uh, we do read the Bible, but because of the weakness of the flesh, particularly in the case of this example, the heel, that we are most vulnerable. So in so-called Greek, and I say so-called Greek mythology, this weakness in the flesh led to physical vulnerability in this man called um, Achilles. It was foretold that he would perish at a young age. His mother, in an effort to prevent his death, dipped his body in a body of water. This water was supposed to have powers of, of invulnerability. Invul in other words, he would not be able to be harmed. Uh, that's why she put him in this body of water. The problem was, according to the myth, because she held his body by the healed heel, that part of his body did not get this protective uh, power that's in this water. So during the Tro Trojan War at the age of 26, Achilles was supposed to have died as a result of a poisoned arrow in his heel. In Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the spirit is willing. The spirit wants to be in the house of God, happy to come to the gates of the house of God and give praise. The spirit wants to pray and have communion with God and, and, and talk and, and, and have communication with God. All of that stuff is our strength, but we have a vulnerability and maybe more than one in the flesh. So the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In Psalms 91 verse five. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day. So God doesn't want us to be afraid of these arrows that come out, out of the quiver of the enemy. And how we rid ourselves of fear is to obey him. When, when he speaks to us, the day that we hear his voice, that we don't harden our hearts, thereby we don't have to be afraid of the arrow that is aimed at the heel. 
as we walk and talk with God, we should be becoming more and more familiar with the triggers that activate the weakness of the flesh that prevent us from getting the victory. The flesh is a minefield of vulnerability. So our flesh is so weak that we easily, uh, the Bible said, the sin that so easily ensnares us. But we don't have to be afraid of the arrow that is aimed at the heel. There are certain areas from person to person that are, are one's Achilles heel. These areas are especially targeted by the enemy. And so these Traumas or these weaknesses, I would say, can come out of childhood traumas, can come out of generational kinds of things, can come out of the secrets that are in our hidden place that makes that part of our flesh particularly vulnerable to the arrow of the enemy. So, in other words, if you are an alcoholic, uh, it would make sense in the natural that, and you know that's your weakness, to withdraw from any kind of scenario, including bars, nightclubs, that would stir it up or would to activate. It just makes sense. And, you know, some people think they're strong enough to handle it. All they need is one example or one experience in that environment, and they should be able to uh, engage with understanding as to this is not something I should be involved in because of the weakness of my own flesh. And for example, if you know you have a lust problem, uh, it would be wise, I would think, not to watch porn <laughs> because that will activate uh, this heel, uh, this flesh. And of course, where's the devil who sees what we do and what we say, he moves the target from there to here. It's an easier target. And it could lead to your own uh, downfall. So you have to get to the root. And these these issues vary from person to person. Where I might not have a a uh, tremendous problem with lust uh, that it it caused my downfall. Um, I might be able even to watch something uh, in that arena, uh, not too much, because obviously you could uh, uh, cause it to swell uh, this this lust. The point I'm trying to make is you should know your own weaknesses. You should be able to by now say this will not be good for me. I should not be in this area. I should not be talking about whatever it is that is the root problem of the issue. The vulnerability of the heel will be exposed because sometimes we don't know. It's even hidden uh, from us. And second, let's go to 1 Corinthians verse 4. And um, oh, let's go first to James 1, 13 through 16. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. So don't say that you're tempted by God, because the scripture goes on to say that God doesn't tempt any man. And why? Continue For to read. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So you, um, I, I'm, I'm going to say it this way, don't provoke the Lord. Don't say. God, you know my heart. Because God cannot tempt and will not tempt anybody. We are drawn away because, continue to read. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has so come. So we, the whole world, so these are the temptations, one that's within, and the other comes from without, the world, the influence of the world, the value system of the world, the, the culture of the world can draw us 
to uh, uh, participate in activating uh, the heel or our own flesh in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. So the hidden things of darkness is when his spirit speaks to us, when the word activates in us. And through that process, God is exposing the hidden things that's in our flesh, particularly in our heel. And the whole thing is to take us away from the purpose and plan and the pleasure of God in pursuit of our own pleasure. Because two things or two entities are going to be satisfied by our pursuit ourselves as an ent- entity, our own pleasure, or we're satisfying the pleasure of God. It's either one or the other. And um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame. So we have renounced the hidden things of shame. We have confessed to God the things that the Spirit brings to us or the Word of God activates in us. We have renounced it. We renounce it to God, and sometimes we have to renounce it to someone else in order that we might be accountable. And it strengthens our resolve not to do something that the Holy Spirit has told us not to. To do that, the word of God has activated in us and has encouraged us by to not do whatever it is that's going to take us away from God's purpose, God's plan, and God's pleasure. The revealing of truth. Did you finish that? Okay, go ahead. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves in every man's conscience in the sight of God. So we commend ourselves to God by um, renouncing the hidden things of darkness, renouncing the things that are in our flesh that we know are against the pleasure of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God. And uh, Psalms 51, verse 1 through 6. David is an, his psalm is an excellent idea of what I'm sharing this evening. To the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. So David confessed this thing before God. Then he wrote the psalm that confessed to who? The whole world. <laughs> you and me. When David wrote this psalm, he didn't, he didn't just go in secret and share with God what his iniquity was, what his sin was, what his transgression was. When God pointed out his heel, his heel that the enemy saw because he saw what he was doing and what he was saying. So the error moved from another part of his flesh to the heel. Continue. Against you, you only, have I sinned. And done this evil in your sight. So people think when it said against you only I sin, and and they sometimes they think they only need to confess with God to God. But but David wrote this psalm, and his confession is to the whole world. His confession from the time he wrote it, it resounds from that time to today. His confession has moved me has encouraged me not only to confess to God, but confess to someone who I know represents that same God. Continue. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. 
Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin my mother conceived me, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the you inward parts. You desire truth. Where? In the inward parts. Because without abiding by the truth of who we really are, we cannot have the, an effective walk with God. Confession and repentance is almost, for most of us, an everyday occurrence. Because we don't want to, the, the, the devil, because he's always, he's going about seeking whom he can devour. We're nothing but prey to him to, to eat us up. And so his, his arrow is on us. For some reason, I'm getting a picture of the Lord of the Ring in that eye that was in the tower for some reason. <laughs> you know, because as long as um, um, uh, Frodo, um, uh, he had to be at a certain angle in order for the eye to turn towards him. It was always on him. He could always feel the presence of the eye. But once he was in view of the arrow or of the eye, you know, he turned to him just like that in the arrow. <laughs> and that's the way the enemy is with us. His, his, the presence, his, his influence is always around trying to get our flesh to bend to his will. But once the heel has been uncovered, <laughs> he turns right to it. Uh, continue. So he desires truth. In the inward parts, continue. And in the hidden and part. And in the hidden part, the part that we hide, the part that we are ashamed of, uh, the trauma, the, the things that happen to us uh, that we have hidden uh, in the heel part of our body of flesh. Uh, he will go, he's going to cause us. Because scripture is clear now, all things do work together for good. And, you know, as you know, I wrestle with that bad things, traumatic things, things that are trauma filled, things that hurt, things that depress, things that happened to me when I was helpless as a child, and those kinds of things. All things, you know, I, I, this is a sidebar, but I was thinking the other day about the faith a mother uh, has. Uh, when they leave a newborn baby on the steps of the church. I mean, for some reason that, that, that hit me the other day, the kind of faith uh, uh, and a trust in God to lay the child. And I'm not going to critique the, the mother's uh, motive and whether it was good or bad, but what I'm looking at when I see that is faith because the scripture is clear when your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will pick you up. So, and I'm going back to childhood trauma and how many children that have been left with on the steps of the church or with a grandmother or with a foster uh, uh, parent or even a neighbor that God came into their lives and he became their father and their mother. And not only did they have some no, no, notoriety uh, in the natural world, but in the spiritual world, because God's word is truth, that all things do work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And in the hidden parts, you will make me to know what? Wisdom. That God's foolishness is wiser than men. It's tremendous. I love it. I love God because I can his his intent of his heart is always exposed. And from the bosom of his heart comes that love. And you can count on it no matter what's going on. You can cleave to it. Um, so I'm off now, but that's okay. <laughs> so his weakness in the flesh. And David's flesh was even hidden from him. He didn't know that that was in his heel. He didn't understand the vulnerability uh, that was in his own heel, in his own hidden in the in the folds, if you will, of his flesh. Second Samuel, verse twelve. I mean, chapter twelve, one through nine. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him. There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing 
except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. He said, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this will surely... He had no idea. It was completely hidden from him. It was in his heel, the most vulnerable part, portrayal, lust, lying. He had no clue until Nathan came to him and shared this parable with him. Continue. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house. And and you think to yourself how good God is to us. How on earth could we portray his love and his trust, his hope? How, How can we do it? Because there is no good thing in the flesh. And you don't know, and I don't know, the things that are in our hidden parts. And, but the word of God has come to expose them that we might have life and that more abundantly. That the arrow of the enemy will fly, but we will not be ashamed or afraid. Continue. I have gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? The Lord says, All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is none right, no, not one. You know, I have six children, as you know. I homeschool them. I raised them. I didn't want them to sin. Impossible. Impossible. Because God has declared all under the same indictment. There is none right. No, not one. And our attitude of self-righteousness sometimes caused the devil to move from one area of the flesh to the hill. Because he has to cause us to know that to to understand or or have wisdom concerning that God is right about everything he says. (laughs) He's correct about everything he does because there is none that is right. God helps, I mean, I'm sorry, none that is good. God makes us right in his sight. Continue. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Adam. He had no idea that that was in the hill. Had no idea, but the enemy sensed by his, what he was doing and what he said, and he moved it to arrow. But now we know all things work together for good when we confess and repent. And tell God, you're right, and I'm wrong. You're the man, and I'm not. So confession is a very important part and repentance of turning away uh, from from the, if you will, the, the wrath of God. And the wrath of God, because of our own actions, leads sometimes to our own downfall. So Take the exit. That's my next little note I have. The exit is confession and repentance. It's the door with the sign over it that's blinking red. Go through this door. Go through this door. Get out of this. Get out of it. And how we get out of that door is by confession and by repentance. In Revelations chapter 3, verse 10. 
Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. So he's going to keep us from the hour of trial and temptation. Even when the poison dot penetrates our heel, the antidote for the arrow that flies by day is confession and repentance. It will never change. It will always be the same because by that methodology, we learn and understand and know wisdom. We are wiser by it. We're stronger by it. If you will, we become more spiritual by it. We are less judgmental by it. So many, uh, we're less self-righteous by it. So many things happen when the antidote is applied to the heel. And poor Achilles, uh, uh, the the so-called mythology of Achilles and his heel, and when the arrow hit his heel, he died. He was 26 years old. But that doesn't have to be the case with you and I spiritually. We don't have to die um, when the arrow happens to find us and actually penetrates our most vulnerable place, our heel, uh, the sin or the transgression or the in- iniquity that dominates our lives, which may not dominate someone else's life. You know, in the natural, people that are alcoholics don't want other people to drink, but other people don't have an alcoholic problem or alcoholism as a problem. So we spiritually do the same kinds of things. Uh, We want people to be under the same law that we're under. And we may not, that person may not need that particular law. They might need a law, but it might not be the one that you have to uh, put on. It's like a bandage on your own heel. You have to put that bandage on your heel that fits you in that area, which might not affect someone else. But let's look at some of the weaknesses uh, of the flesh uh, because we know it's a weakness because there's a work of the flesh that is manifested through weakness, uh, the weakness of the flesh in Romans 8, verse 5 through 9. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So if your mind is always about how to please yourself, then there is no way you can please God. Because it's a mindset. Either I pleasure myself or I'm going to pleasure God. And they are two opposite directions. Continue. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. You cannot, um, you cannot reason with flesh. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of a. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, and I can't remember the name of this. Years and years ago, I watched this movie, and uh, it was a plant in a shop. Somebody who, if you can, little shop of horrors, but the name of the plant, anyway, this plant was in there, and it required, and you know, this is back in the day, back in the day, back in the day. I don't look at this kind of stuff now, but it wouldn't matter if I did, but I don't. But the point I'm trying to make, it wanted blood. You know, always it could, could see more, was it see more? Could, <laughs> Or it said, feed me Seymour. <laughs> yes, the plant. And what the plant wanted was blood, human blood. And that's what the enemy wants, dust, human dust. <laughs> he wants to eat you up. But the carnal mind cannot be reasoned with. That's why the only way you can bring it down is to pray it down. And you want what God wants for you more than what you want for your own flesh. It cannot be subject to the law of God. Continue. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we're in the flesh. We cannot please God. And do you know the enemy knows when we're in the flesh? (laughs) And we cannot please God. 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 24. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. And I'm going to stop you there because you can read that whole list yourself. It's a bunch of stuff that's in our flesh, including disobedience, pride, lust, 1 Corinthians six fifteen through 18, because it goes on and on and on. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Flee, flee, flee. Because when the enemy sees you're not fleeing, he moves his arrow from one part of you and move it to the, 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 the arrow, that, the heel where the arrow can have the most impact for your downfall. The word and the spirit speaks to us about the sin that so easily ensnares us. Hebrews 12, verse 1. It so easily ensnares us. Therefore, because, go ahead. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. It's so easily because of the weakness of our flesh and and only through and by the empowerment of our spirit can we overcome the flesh. In John chapter 15, verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now so they God have said, when, when I speak to you, see, if I, if I don't speak to you, then you are not aware but once the word of God speaks to you, you have no excuse. In John 16, verse 16, I'm saying John 16, verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come. When the spirit, when your spirit speaks to me, when your spirit speaks to me, when your spirit speaks to me and leading me into the truth, not about your neighbor. Not about the, per the parishioner that sit next to you in church. About yourself. God doesn't have you sitting under the sound of a word for your neighbor. He has you in this chair for so you can hear the word and apply it to your own life. So when God says, be careful, the heel is being exposed. And the enemy knows when you are exposing your own vulnerability by what you say and what you do. So we're going to look at um, um, Samson um, and um, the vulnerability of his heel in his life. Here again, because the scripture says, don't be deceived. There was deception working in his life. And when we, uh, the vulnerability of our heel is exposed, you can believe that most of the time there is some deception that hid it uh, from us. And on some level, we think we are uh, invulnerable to uh, whatever the consequences of the action that we are doing. In Judges, chapter 13, verse 3 and 5. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall deliver, he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. What a calling. And this thing is, is a serious thing. What a responsibility that Samson was carrying on his shoulder. But do you know Samson uh, did not recognize or did not understand the weight of the responsibility. And he was at play. 
in the fields of the Lord. Uh, it was somewhat of a joke to him. Uh, and I'm not saying it to judge him. I'm saying because sometimes we don't understand the weight of being a child of God and how we have to represent in a wicked and perverse generation. And so he didn't understand the calling or the weight of the responsibility. Uh, to a certain extent, I think he played with the anointing. Uh, that's why he was in, and, you know, he would uh, um, uh, go down and pleasure himself. Uh, the responsibility of being a judge in Israel did not have its full impact the way maybe it should have. In Judges chapter 16, starting with verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. I mean, you know, he was at play in the fields of the Lord. And sometimes when you at play in the fields of the Lord, you don't know that the enemy is has an arrow that he's readying uh, to bring you down uh, because a vulnerability is getting ready to be exposed that you may or may not be aware of. Continue. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. And Samson lay low until midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So he was the man, and he knew and was aware of his strength, of his powers, of, of, of his ability because of the anointing uh, to get out of, if you will, situations. Continue. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, that's what, he's all over the place. <laughs> you know, he's not aware that he has a heel, <laughs> that he has a vulnerability, you see. Continue. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind to him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies, and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried... I mean, he's, he's playing... You see, he, he, he's not understanding the seriousness of the calling on his life, the seriousness of the responsibility uh, towards his people, uh, the seriousness of his responsibility for, of his own family and his wife. And he's playing a game, but he doesn't understand that the enemy sees a hill that's growing by the day because he was always after him. He was always had his arrow trained on different parts of his flesh, hoping for a kill, if you will. But one is being uh, manifested through all of this that he's doing. Continue. Then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. So he was aware of these men rushing in every time, you, you know. But he figured, you know, he deception was working big time. You know, he thought, you know, not a problem. Every time, and she had several uh, things that uh, several incidents continue. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. So he said to her, If they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. You know, you keep tempting, you keep tempting and tempting and you didn't get caught that time. 
Nothing happened that time. There was no immediate consequence that time. And and as someone said, well, you're playing with fire. You you keep on, keep on, keep on, continue. Tell me what you And made. you know, you're beginning at through all of this. Certainly, he must have known that she was setting him up. Was he that delusional? Maybe. Some people are. They are that delusional that they cannot understand, see, perceive. And so, because nothing has happened yet. See, that's the greatest delusion of all. When you do something against yourself or someone else and nothing happens immediately, you don't shrink, you grow, you wax even more bold. Continue. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, So she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep, and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you? There it is. See, it gets gets more and more um, exacting. You know, you can do this. Why can't you do it? If you love me, it goes on and on and on. Continue. When your heart is not with me. You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. See, because Samson doesn't think that he has an area of his life that's vulnerable. He's been victorious all his life. He knows he's special. He has an anointing. Continue. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. And he told her so they, they're in a relationship now. That's what happens with sin. First, you know, you, you, you kind of know them casually. I'm talking about sin. You know it casually. Uh, and then you, it moves up to uh, friendship, you know. Then you become lovers. And now you're daily. Daily, something that you had a hesitant hand with doing initially, now it's par for the course. Continue. That he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God for my mother's womb. Then his secret, but he told the wrong person. You know, there is a... um, I'm looking for a word. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) You have to tell the right person. You just can't tell anybody (laughs) your secret. You know, you can't tell, you know, because you feel down and, you know, let me share with this family member. That might be the worst person to share with because then it goes throughout the whole family. I mean, you better off uh, talking to a homeless person. I mean, if you really got to get it out. (laughs) It's, the danger is quite lessened that that's going to get out, whatever you just said. But the point I'm trying to make is that some people are the wrong people yes. to confess things to. Yes. You have to be led of the Spirit of God. And there's no, I'm not trying to disrespect these wrong people, but that's reality. Go ahead. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart. She sent and called for all the- his heart. She told him, all his heart was the thing that made his heel vulnerable. And the arrow smith sniffed it, sniffed, sniffed it, and it moved right to it. And the poison in the arrow hit the heel. Continue. She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought her the money. And bought her the money. Uh, That's another um, device or or attraction or magnet Mm -hmm. the enemy uses to get us to fall away from God. But go ahead. But in her case, they bought her the money. Go ahead. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had So him a man sh- came. She didn't even do it. The, a man came and did what? Called him to shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. 
And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And so you can read the rest of the story for yourself, but his own pride, his foolishness, not taking his calling seriously, lust, all of this and others, other weakness of the flesh combined for this one huge Achilles heel. The enemy couldn't miss him. Couldn't miss him. The thing swelled up so bad that it obliterated the other parts of his flesh. This was the big dog, the main attraction. This whole episode here. And despite his overall strength, because that's what Achilles' heel is, is a weakness that downplays your strengths. And once he fed it and teased it and played with it, he made it so appetizing to the enemy, that he shot his arrow and failed him. In Hebrews 11, verse 32. But because, as I shared before, Achilles' heel is a weakness in spite of overall strength that can lead to a downfall. I marvel at the faith of Samson. And in Hebrews eleven thirty-two. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson. And And Samson. How in the world? Because God is able to uphold his own. Who should say anything to God or say something about God's elect? If God is for us, who can be against us? So despite his Achilles heel, despite the vulnerability of his flesh, God, because Samson has faith in God. And if you read, continue to read the story, even when he was down, he refused to surrender his faith in God. He was down, but not out. Okay. He, he got up and when he felt that his hair was coming back, he knew that his God was with him. God could have kept him bald-headed and refused for the hair to grow just by not having it grow. But his hair started to grow. And he was blind, but he wasn't stupid when he felt the stubble stubble on the top of his head that his hair was growing back. So God is able to keep us. And he started confessing. I'm sure those days and nights that he spent in his his, uh, uh, jail cell, that he cried his eyeballs out. He saw the foolishness of his action. He saw how he didn't take uh, the, the responsibility, the anointing, the election, and the calling seriously. He, he said, Lord, if I could do it again, I would change things. He saw where all of his lusting led him away from God. So in that jail cell, you're talking about a confession and repentance, my God. And we know that that happened because his faith didn't fail him. He knew that the Lord was still with him. So he asked that little boy to come. Let me fill the pillars of this house. God, be with me as I take out more than I ever did. But I don't want to live, Lord. I'm not even worthy to live. But let me honor you. Let me glorify you. Let your name be exalted. Let the people down the road see that even when they fail, if they look up to God, he is able to make them stand. I thank God this evening that with all of the Achilles heels that's up in the house, God is able when we stray, when we're deceived and delusional, from that place, with the poison arrow in your heel, crowd to God that he would have mercy on us. So, Father, I commend this time back into your hands. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.